You are listening to Fantasy Film Ball with Matt and Dylan, and on this show, we turn movies into sports and look at all the Oscar prospects and their fantasy value. I believe that this is going to win Best Picture, and here's why. I mean, Denis Villeneuve got all the nominations he needed for do and still missed out on the Best Director slot. Don't let me get my hopes up. The Academy has disappointed me too many times. Thank you to the Academy. Thank you to all of you in this room. I can't remember the last time I walked out of the movie theater on such a high. No matter how certain it seems, anything can happen on nominations morning. Never count the Golden Globes for just doing something off the walls and bonkers. It's the kind of movie that reminds me of why I fell in love with movies. And the Oscar goes to... Welcome into episode 20 of Fantasy Filmball. My name is Dill. And my name is Matt, and this is the show where we turn movies into sports and sports into something that we don't talk about here. And this week, we are going to be talking about, uh, you might have guessed it from the title, the Best Actress Showdown in the Oscar race right now. Uh, Because this week, we both saw Till, starring Daniel Deadweiler, and... I saw it a little bit ago, uh, Tar, but you saw it this week, Dylan. And uh, otherwise, before we get into that showdown, we've got some other stuff to talk about, which is very exciting. But Dylan, how was your week? My week's been pretty fun. I uh, had like a week or so where I didn't really see many movies, but uh, starting, I think it was past uh, Wednesday, I have seen a movie every day and it will continue into next week because my film festival's coming up so fast, but uh, yes, Till and Tar were a part of this little mini personal film festival journey that I've been on right now, and there's been some highs, there have been some lows, but we'll get into that throughout the rest of the show. How's your week been so far? Oh, uh, first, I want to ask you, you got your festival tickets, right, this week? Yes, so essentially they gave me the pass, they gave me the confirmation for everything. There's some movies that are still up in the air, depending on, like, if I'm getting in, if I'm not getting in just due to capacity, but I do have my list of confirmed movies and other movies that I'm on the priority list, just I have to like show up and then like once I get there, they're like, okay, yeah, we have a ticket. Here you go. So you're press, right? That's awesome. Correct. Yes, I'm really excited. This is my first time being pressed for the festival, so it'll be really interesting to have another dynamic going in. Because normally what I do is I try to see just one or two movies a day, but this year I'm going to be seeing, kind of like taking a, a page out of your book with uh, Tiff, seeing some, I think my most in the day is going to be four, but I think every day except for Wednesday is going to be three. Nice, nice. So what do you already have reserved that you're excited for? So I know I'm in all the non-premium screenings that I asked for. So I think that includes, like she said, The Sun, All the Beauty and the Bloodshed, My Father's Dragon, um, Living. And I think there's some other ones in there as well. And then I am not officially in the EO. That's the one where they're like, we may not be able to get you in just because the demand is so high for this movie, which, you know, yeah, the power listeners of, of the, the show. Donkey. Yes, listeners of the show knows how much that will pain me because EO is one that we've been hyping up all season long. I really want to lay eyes on to be like, yeah, I actually do like this movie. It's not just a meme. But um, oh, man, Women I Talking... I you like it. <laughs> um, Women Talking is also on that list. That's one that they said, as long as I show up, I'll get a ticket. Because for the premium movies, from my understanding how it works is they can't give you tickets ahead of time, but once you get there, they'll give you a ticket. That way they can still keep some availability for other people. That way it's not just like someone who says, I want to see everything. So give me a ticket to everything and that takes away tickets from other people. Uh, but that those ones include Women Talking, Devotion, Glass Onion, and Empire of Light. Well, I'm really looking forward to hearing your thoughts on She Said. I saw the trailer again today and I've definitely been reading a lot of back and forth on that one where pe- some people are like, oh, it's brilliant. And some people are like, ooh, Hollywood making a movie about Hollywood not being guilty for yeah. all of this. Is, ooh. So I really am looking forward to hearing your thoughts on it. But anyways, we are going to get into our show now. And we always start off with a question. And this week, the question, Dylan, this is your question. Uh, so I'm going to let you take it away. So Matt mentioned already, both of us have seen Tar finally. A lot of you out there have seen Tar as well. It expanded wide this weekend. And my question is, how did Lydia Tarr get her EGOT? Because they mentioned in the movie that she is in this illustrious club of winning an Emmy, a Grammy, an Oscar, a Tony. But they don't say how. They just say that she's won it. So my question to Matt and everyone out there listening is, how do you think Lydia Tarr got her EGOT? Yeah, comment. Leave your comments below. Serious answers only. Kidding. No serious answers. <laughs> Let, let's start with Emmys. Um, so... My answer, I think she won her Emmy for hosting SNL. Uh, I think Mm -hmm. that she was the host and musical guest of Saturday Night Live, and that's how she won her Emmy. 
Um, what about you? What's what's your hunch on Lydia Tarr's Emmy? So I saw a meme on Twitter, which is actually what made me think of this question, and it was Lydia Tarr, like on a magazine cover with the Muppets. And like uh, she did like a TV special with them. I'm like, yes, that's how she won her Emmy. She got with the Muppets, and she wasn't negative or she wasn't condescending. She was happy, positive Lydia Tarr, and hanging out with the Muppets just brought all the best of her, and that best included an Emmy win. So Grammy, what do you think for uh, for Grammy? So I'm gonna take the easy cop out answer here. The Grammy, I think, is the easiest one. She won for the cl- uh, classical category of the Grammys because they have so many categories. Uh, classical music is w- included in those, and I think that's the easiest answer. But I, I could see mm-hmm. a world out there where maybe she uh, did a song for a movie or something that was so big that it did get nominated, like the song or the record of the mm-hmm. year sort of thing. But I'm really excited to hear what your answer is. So I'm gonna give the opposite uh, opinion here. I actually think because I I think of Lydia Tarr is very similar to a Hildur Gunadotir type because Hildur Gunadotir is someone who very much has always been obviously in the classical stream and experimental stream but Hildur Gunadotir is also a metal musician so you know what I'm gonna say it's very likely she won in the classical category but I would not be surprised if she did some sort of metal collaboration and won in that category. So you know what? I'm going to stick with it and say that she won for a collab album with the band Korn. Nice. Nice. That's it. I like it. that answer. That's a, okay, it's an Oscar. inspired answer. Okay, Oscar. What's, what's her Oscar? This is an Oscar podcast, so what is her Oscar? And I think the answer is obvious. She wrote a song for Don't Look Up. Uh, and bested Diane Warren's 20th nomination. Yes, I love that answer. I also think another obvious answer here is, I mean, you made the comparison earlier with Hilder. In this theoretical world, uh, Lydia Tarr could have the score for Joker. She fits the uh, mm-hmm. the themes of Joker a little bit, but but being a more inspired or just reaching out their choice is um, using last year's example as well. Um, West Side Story had a uh, new rendition and... Uh, another movie that did not get nominated was Cyrano, but for that musical, they redid all the compositions for the movie, so they could be eligible, it just didn't get nominated. So I'm thinking for the West Side Story reboot, uh, not reboot, but re- revival by Steven Spielberg, uh, Lydia Tarr redid all the orchestral sections for the film and uh, followed in her idol Leonard Bernstein's footsteps to uh, win an award for the West Side Story. I I really like that answer, although the, the only thing would be that she would have to completely write a new score, which at that point it would no longer be West Side Story. But I, I can see a world where they're like, they would do something where they adapt it so much. There used to be an Oscar category called Best Adapted Score, which confuses me a lot. <laughs> uh, I don't know what that category is supposed to be. But if there was still a Best Adapted Score category, I feel like that would be an easy answer for what Lydia Tower would have won. She would have won for an orchestration of someone else's work. All right, last one, Tony Award. And again, this one's obvious. She won for the SpongeBob SquarePants musical. Nice, yes, yeah. yes. Give her the all the or she swept the Tony season. Yeah, for the for the SpongeBob SquarePants musical, which was a very different musical in that universe. It was very dark. Wow. I for one would love to see Lydia Tarr's SpongeBob SquarePants musical. I would too. And here again, I'm being the lame one with the more generic type answer. But uh, you mentioned t- a cold. You mentioned dark. What's more cold and dark than The Crucible? And uh, Lydia Tarr goes on a little rant in the movie that we'll get into a little bit later about cancel culture. And The Crucible kind of was like the original cancel culture type play uh, with themes of it. And I feel like this is just a very full circle type moment for her uh, like she has in the scene in the film where it just ties everything together. And I mean, The Crucible has had a revival before. So maybe Lydia Tarr was the one doing the score for that revival. It's true. There is a Tony Award for Best Musical Score for a Play. So I feel like that would be a very easy one, unless she did the orchestrations for a musical, but I don't I don't think that would be it. I, I think you're on the right track with scoring a play or adding music to a revival of something very classic. So moving from someone who's won the EGOT to just the, the O part of the EGOT, we have some Oscar news with our mm-hmm. update here for the week, and a lot of people put out their four-year consideration ads and the one that most people were searching out for, we finally got confirmation for Babylon. Margot Robbie, Diego Calva, our lead and 
Brad Pitt is in supporting. I don't think personally this switches all too much in my rankings, how I've had them in the moment. Does this change anything for you, Matt? No, it does not change anything at all for me. I still think that Diego Calva is not going to be notable enough just as a personality to get in. I think Margot Robbie is still going to get into the five, and I do... I have Brad Pitt at my number five slot, and I'm a little bit torn because I feel like he should not be there. But at the same time, I want to wait and see how the reactions to the film come out because if people start piling on him, he's done. But I think Mm -hmm. we have to wait and see until the Critics' Choice, until the Golden Globes, and then we can make some definitive statements of, is Brad Pitt in? I currently have him down to number four, um, and then I have the Fablemans just taking up spot five. Which actor is it going to be? Is it going to be Hirsch? Is it going to be Dano? I've even heard some buzz for Rogan. Do I believe that? No, but there's some buzz out there. So I had the Fablemans kind of just locked in for spot five. I no longer think that movie's getting two supporting actor nominations like we talked about before. But moving away from Best Supporting Actor, because that, like Matt said, sight unseen a lot of, like with Babylon and some other films, but uh, we have some actual nominations that happened this past week. We had oh, the, yeah. Uh, we had the Critics' Choice documentary. So now let's switch it up and get a little bit yeah. bigger. We, we got to rise to the top slowly. And now we have the Gotham Awards. And this one gave some people a lot of points. And some other people were very disappointed with their turnout. And where would you like to start here? Because there's a lot of categories to go over. What, let's let's just go through the categories one by one. We'll, we'll see which things are interesting in them, which things maybe some of the categories just have nothing that anyone picked, and we can, we can kind of talk through. So let's start Breakthrough Director. So the Gotham Awards, they do not have a director award. They have an award for a first-time director. So the nominees here are Owen Klein for Funny Pages, Elegance Bratton for The Inspection, uh, Antonetta Alamat Kusajinovic for Marina, Beth D. Araujo uh, for Soft and Quiet, and Jane Schoenbrunn for We're All Going to the World's Fair. So I don't know what you feel about this category, but looking at it like right away, I feel like this is just a lock for Elegance Bratton. I think that's just basically a guaranteed thing. Did you hear he's rumored to be the new director for Marvel's Blade? I actually heard that from you, and I'm really excited, hey. just like you were. And <laughs> um, I mean, they need a director, and why not get the possible Gotham Breakthrough Director winner to helm the Marshall Lee Blade movie? Yeah. Well, what I'm actually curious about is how is the inspection going to perform at the Indie Spirit Awards? Because I think it has quite a big upside there. Uh, but the Breakthrough Director category, this only gives one point for a nomination and another point for a win, so this is not a very big one. Uh, But we've got Best Screenplay. This is a little bit bigger. This one gets you five points for a nomination, five points for a win. So the nominees here are After Yang, Armageddon Time, Catherine Called Birdie, Tar, and Women Talking. What's your takeaway on this category? Because I got a big one here. So the biggest one to me is Armageddon Time showing up. This is a movie that... I know I've been a lot lower on than um, some other people have. I think you've also been there with me a little bit lower. You're still higher than me. Uh, But that showing up shows there is support for this movie, at least somewhere. It's not a complete throwaway because uh, you mentioned seeing the She Said trailer uh, recently and having thoughts about it. I saw the Armageddon Time trailer earlier today, and the trailer just does not work for me. I'm like, I don't understand what this movie is trying to say or do. It has so many different tones and vibes. But clearly, the trailer is not a good reflection of the movie because the movie's shown up here for a screenplay award. No, I'm with you. It doesn't really do much for me. Okay, my big takeaway here. What's not here, Dylan? Um, I think just everything, everything, everywhere, all all at once. Yeah, that's wild. But overall, I mean, this is a good showing here for Tar, for Women Talking. I think uh, those two are the ones to watch for the win here, but I think the edge goes to Tar because it is in other categories here, whereas Women Talking, it's here, and then it's uh, in supporting actor as well. But, I mean, I'd love to see Women Talking win this. And Breakthrough Performer. This is another one doesn't really have much uh, crossover here. Got Frankie Corio for After Sun, Callie Reyes for Catch the Fair One, Gracia Philip, uh, Flipovic for Marina, Anna Diop for Nanny, and Anna Cobb for We're All Going to the World's Fair. And yeah, this is, again, not a big category, but 
uh, I think people have After Sun and Nanny. Uh, so I think it's pretty obvious here that Frankie Corio is probably taking this for After Sun. Maybe Anna Diop for Nanny. To this category, at least, I think uh, Frankie Corio is going to sweep all of the Breakthrough Performer Awards throughout the whole season. Yeah. Young actor, breaking uh, Breakthrough Performer. It's just going to be Frankie Corio, Frankie Corio, Frankie Corio. And, mm, mm, actually, I just remembered... Uh, you know who's going to absolutely sweep that category when people start seeing the film? The kid from Close. The kid from Close is going to bulldozer that category everywhere. Uh, ev- everywhere that is open to, to foreign language films for that category. Uh, so outstanding supporting performance. This one, there's some uh, some good ones in here. Actually, Literally all of the nominees here are from films that people have selected, which is great. So we've got Mark Rylance for Bones and All, um, Brian Tyree Henry for Causeway, Kei Kwan for Everything Ever All at Once, Raul Castillo for The Inspection, Gabrielle Union for The Inspection, Nina Haas for Tar, uh, Noemi Merlant for Tar, Hong Chow for The Whale, and then Jesse Buckley and Ben Wishaw for Women Talking. So what's, what's your overall take here? You've got plenty of films that are on your team that are in here. You've got The Inspection. Uh, do you have Causeway on your team? Or am- I do not have Causeway on my team, uh, but in another really? league I do have Bones and All. So I have The Inspection of both and then Bones and All in that other league. But yeah, I really like this lineup, putting my team or film ball aside. Uh, even though some films here I haven't seen, from what I've heard, very inspired choices, seen... Uh, Kihei Kwan showing up is always fun because let's get the hype started now so he can win at the end of the day. And after seeing Tar, the uh, nominations for both of those supporting actresses are very much uh, deserved. Right. Yeah, and I'm I'm sad to see that Claire Foy is not here. I'm a little surprised that Ben Wishaw made it over Claire Foy here. I can see why Jesse Buckley is here for sure, but Ben Wishaw over Claire Foy is a baffling decision. I'm very happy for you that you have two actors from the inspection in here and of course so so happy for waymond kwan being in here is so good i think he's just gonna steamroll this category i think it's his like right away we can just go like yeah let's just give this award to him right now and we've got outstanding lead performance we got kate blanchett in tar daniel deadweiler in till i wonder if we're going to talk about those two later Dale Maybe. Dickey for A Love Song, Colin Farrell for After Yang, Brendan Fraser for The Whale, Paul Mescal for After Sun, Van Dewey Newton for God's Country, Aubrey Plaza for Emily the Criminal, Taylor Russell for Bones and All, Michelle Yeoh for Everything Everywhere All at Once. If I had to predict the two winners that are going to come out on top here, I am going to be honest, it's going to be Kate Blanchett and Michelle Yeoh. We'll, we'll get into... The Oscar Best Actress later, but I think that you'll probably be right for the Gothams, at least. I think that Everything Everywhere All at Once is not going to go away winless. And without spoiling other categories, I think it, this is its second best shot after uh, what we just talked about in supporting performance. Mm-hmm. Okay, you know what the most interesting nomination is here? Aubrey Plaza and Emily the Criminal. That yeah, feels I mean, like out of nowhere. Seen- I haven't seen it, but I've heard very good buzz for the movie. It just came out recently, if I'm not mistaken, so it's on people's minds. Um, I really think the uh, God's Country uh, nomination here is also very inspired, a movie that maybe isn't as talked about right now, but at one point was a very highly uh, praised movie upon its release. Yeah, or even Colin Farrell for After Yang. That does feel like a substitution nomination for Banshees because he's not eligible for Banshees. And then I really like their Dale Dickey nomination for a love song, which I haven't seen, but I think Dale Dickey is so underrated. She's fantastic in Winter's Bone and really does deserve a lot more praise. But yeah, I mean, oh, see, here's the other thing. I did just say that Kate Blanchett and Michelle Yeoh were going to share the prize, but I forgot Brendan Fraser's here. I forgot Brendan Fraser's here. Yeah, so... I'll also ask what I just said about Michelle Yeoh seems likely here. Yeah, I think it's Frazier and Blanchett. Um, I also somehow glanced over Brendan Fraser while looking at that. And I don't know. I don't see Brendan Fraser going home without the award, just with how much love, how much praise he's been getting so far throughout the press tour for The Whale. So I feel like that would continue here. And then it comes down to a few other people. And Blanchett and Tar is seeming 
right person or right time? Do I think that's going to carry over to our other awards? We'll have to see. But here, that seems pretty likely. Yeah, it does seem. It seems pretty likely overall. And then we got our best international feature lineup. Now, the Gotham's are U.S. based, and you have to be a U.S. based production in order to qualify for it, which is interesting because After Sun's there, but I guess they qualify because there's some American producers and American money in there, but it is a Scottish film. Um, but the nominees here are Athena, which I just watched, and it's absolutely magnificent. Have you seen it yet? I have not. Oh, man. <laughs> Oh, Athena blew me away. Anyways, other nominees, Banshees of Inisherin, so that is our UK production here. We got Corsage, which I'm a little bit surprised to see Corsage uh, here, and maybe I'll reevaluate if people are going to like that more than I do. Decision to Leave, Happening, and St. Omer. Um, all of these are in our league, I think, right? So... That's actually, that's a pretty good hit rate for an international feature category, having all of them in our game at the moment. Um, I think this one's pretty clearly going to Banshees, though. Yeah, uh, Banshees should, I mean, they obviously aren't going to put out the total vote polls, but I would assume Banshees can get over 95% of the vote in this category. It seems, it seems so obvious that maybe Decision to Leave happen. might challenge, though. That's the thing. I think Decision to Leave will put up a fight, but... I do think, in the end, Banshees wins, hands down. Mm -hmm. All right. And then Best Documentary Feature. We got All That Breathes, finally. Oh, my God, finally All That Breathes. All the Beauty and the Bloodshed, rightfully so. I Didn't See You There, The Territory, and What We Leave Behind. So I've never heard of What We Leave Behind before, but the other four really make sense here. Um... I love All That Breathes. I love All the Beauty and the Bloodshed. I like I Didn't See You There, and I've heard great things about the territory. Was, um, just for questioning, was Descendant or Fire Love or Navalny eligible here, or are they ineligible at the Gotham's? Ooh, good question. I have no idea about those. Um, I would... I would assume that all of those should have been eligible, so I don't know okay. why why they're not here. So the best feature lineup, which is actually very interesting because there's two films that are very unexpected. We've got After Sun. We've got The Cathedral, which I had I think I've barely heard of, but I, I've heard of it. Dos Estaciones, which is a Mexican film, I believe, um, and I've heard great things about that one too. And then we've got Everything Everywhere All at Once and Tar. And I, I want to hear your take on it, but I think for me, I'm going to assume that the winner is one of those last two. It's going to be Everything Ever All at Once or Tar. I'd lean towards this being the beginning of the Everything Everywhere sweep. I think if the Everything Everywhere sweep is going to be real, it definitely starts here. I think there is a good chance that After Sun could come out on top just of how much love there is for that movie happening at this moment with its uh, Rotten Tomato score, with its nomination haul across the board here. You mentioned Everything Everywhere Missing and Screenplay being a big omission, but I think Women Talking Missing Feature is a bigger than yeah, that's, that's pretty Everything bad. Everywhere Missing and Screenplay. Yeah, that there's really no excuse for Women Talking not being here. Although, to be fair, I mean, the Gothams kind of go off of what's expected a lot of the time. They're always a little bit more scrappy and a little bit weirder. But I, I want to pose this question. So there was like a span of multiple years where Best Picture contenders were winning every single year at the Indie Spirit Awards. Like, I'm just going to read you the stretch of winners from 2009 till 2017, okay? Okay. Okay. So, uh, this is the Indie Spirit Awards. So, in 2009, Precious won, and that was nominated for Best Picture and won Adapted Screenplay. Then, in 2010, Black Swan won the Indie Spirit Award. Also nominated, uh, four out of five of the Indie Spirit nominations that year were Best Picture nominees, because there was also 127 Hours, The Kids Are Alright, and Winter's Bone. And then, 2011, we have two of them uh, are... Indie, uh, our Best Picture nominees, including the winner, which is The Artist, which went on to win Best Picture. And then The Descendants is also here, which was arguably second place there. And then 2012, we've got um, Silver Linings Playbook winning the Indie Spirit Award and then coming into the Best Picture race. 
2013, we've got 12 Years a Slave winning the Indie Spirit Award right there. In 2014, we had a mini matchup of what ended up happening at the actual Oscars between Birdman and Boyhood, uh, which were both up for Best Picture and were the were the two front runners here. And Birdman won the Indie Spirit Award and then went on to the Oscar. Uh, also nominated that year was Selma and Whiplash for the Indie Spirit. 2015, Spotlight wins. Uh, the Indie Spirit wins the Oscar. 2016, Moonlight wins the Indie Spirit, wins the Oscar. Also nominated was Manchester by the Sea. 2017, Get Out wins the Indie Spirit, wins original screenplay. Also nominated, we have Call Me By Your Name and Lady Bird. And then after that, it's kind of broken from it. Although in 2020, we did have Nomadland win the Indie Spirit and then win Best Picture. So there was like a run of years where the indie spirit was like a really strong correlation with winning best picture because you had the artist 12 years a slave birdman spotlight and moonlight all in the span of like six years so here's my question is this year the return of the indie spirits being relevant when do the indie spirit nominations come out indie spirits nominations come out um I think either the end of November or early December. Because I think that everything you brought to the table right there is very good points. And I would love to see it actually come back because I like when there's a little bit of seeds like early in the season. Like, oh, this is what it could be. But will it actually end up turning out like that instead of um, other things? But I'm really excited to see if that trend yeah. does return. Do you have any thoughts about if it's going to return or not? Well, I, I just want to put forward – all of the Oscar contenders that are eligible for the Indie Spirits, because it's more so than there have been in, in some previous years. We've got Everything Ever All at Once, Women Talking, Tar, uh, The Whale, Till. I really think that that's going to kind of show us where the race is. And if one of those that are qualified for the, the Indie Spirits misses, that's probably bad news for that one. Like, if everything everywhere mm-hmm. all at once is not there, that's horrible news. If Women Talking misses, that's really bad news for Women Talking. So, yeah, I think, I do actually think that this year we should be watching the Indie Spirits a little bit more closely than normal because some of the very big contenders, including films that are likely going to win screenplay prizes, are eligible. Good, good to know. Then, end of the November, here we come, one month away, the time to see if all those movies that you just mentioned are rise in the ranks or are they going to start to fall like we may have seen at the start here with the Gothams with women talking missing in picture or everything ever missing in screenplay. But moving on from awards into our next segment of today's show the trailers uh we asked last week and we got it the first look at pale blue eye with christian bale netflix uh end of the year early 2023 and um honestly it didn't really do anything it was like a 40 second teaser but uh we can say this movie does exist and with it existing i think that automatically has christian bale and like the 10 slot at uh the uh golden globe drama actor yeah <sighs> It didn't do anything for me. Dude, I mean, Scott Cooper has just been, like, making this had Oscar buzz, like, over and over and over, which, like, pains me because I think I've talked about it on the show before. I really like Black Mass. I really do. Mm -hmm. And I think that just all of his films have gotten just so... They always seem like they're going to be big contenders, and then you see the trailer and you're like, oh, maybe not. (laughs) Maybe this isn't the contender that we hoped it was. Um, And then, anyways, another Netflix movie that got some new footage. We've got more footage from Bardo, a new trailer. And I think it looks a lot better. I do. I'm still not in love with it, but what do you think? You're you're the big Bardo fan, the big stan here. Yeah, I mean, you mentioned big contender. Here it is. Netflix's biggest contender for this season, Bardo. Best picture, best director, actor, screenplay, visual effects. Wish it all to an existence. Give me my film ball points. I need them after Pass Up on the Fable Woman's. But I (sighs) thought this trailer looked really good, too. Um, Really excited. Regal actually put out news the other day that they're going to be showing this, which will be the first time ever uh, Regal has shown a Netflix movie in cinemas. And I would assume the same thing would carry over to AMC, but I haven't seen them post anything about that. So that's cool information outside of this trailer. But, um... Uh, Bardo is still one that I am very much anticipating, and uh, 
But you'll be happy, at least, Matt, that I did pick Women Talking over Bardo to go watch uh, next week. So uh, I am. My, I am very my happy about did not, that. So, uh, my biases did not drag that far into the discussion here. Well, especially now that you know you will be able to see Bardo in theaters, like, shortly thereafter. Exactly. But something that I know I'm actually very hyped for, and you're probably even more hyped because you get to meet the guy in just over a week, uh, or just under a week now at this point, because yep. the festival's coming up pretty quick. But we got a new trailer for Ant-Man and the Wasp, Quantum Mania, and Jonathan Majors looks absolutely fantastic as Kang the Conqueror. What did you think of this trailer? Because I know I was just like floored by it. I loved it. So I will be the bearer of bad news, and I did not really like this trailer. It didn't Ooh. really give me much. I'm still really excited for the movie because I think Ant-Man is a fun character, and I do not hate Ant-Man 1 or Ant-Man 2. I think they're both solid enough movies. Um, and this one I'm expecting more of the same, but I'm really excited to see what they do with Kang, what Jonathan Majors gets to bring to the table, and just how Marvel uh, pushes forward, because this, if I'm not mistaken, it's the first movie of Phase 5. So, yeah, it is. obviously, we, yep. don't know, we don't know how Phase 4 ends with Wakanda Forever not out yet, but this will be the start of a new phase. Phase 4 is one I was not really a fan of, outside of, like, yeah, me neither. three things. So, I'm hoping for an improvement, a return to form for Marvel, but uh, we want to wait long, because February is just around the corner yeah so i i'll say why i liked this trailer i love the fact that because ant-man those movies all have always been fun but they haven't really been substantial i love all the visuals with like them riding on insects that are like they look like bacteria that they're riding on i love the cities that are in there i love the fact that it feels like they're doing star wars with all the different creatures and the cool designs and this feeling of like another world another universe within our own universe i think that's just so so interesting and Honestly, I could not be more excited for Ant-Man Quantumania. With this trailer, it kind of felt like they were saying, all right, we're done with the kind of the throwaway films for Phase 4. Now we're going to get back to the meat of the story. You see, you you got me a little bit more hype after hearing you uh, talk about it. And I know everyone out there is going to be like, you're such a geek. You're, this is so dumb. Marvel's not Oscars. Well, guess what, everyone? Yeah. We did get a trailer for an Oscar movie this week. Tom Hanks, A Man Called Otto. What would you think? Uh, <laughs> um, it, where'd you go, Bernadette? Yes, 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 exactly. That's what I think, too, because this movie, people have been saying, oh, Tom Hanks could be our fifth Best Actor nominee, Golden Globe nominee. This is it. This is it. No, this is Tom Hanks just having fun in a lighthearted movie meant for a four-quadrant demographic box office that is just there. There's nothing to it. To uh, end off our rampant trailer discussion for the week, we have an actual Oscar contender being The Sun, which maybe isn't even an Oscar contender anymore because this trailer does not look good. And I know all the reviews says this movie is not good. I'm still holding out hope. I get to find out in like four or five days, something like that. But... Yeah, this trailer did not help my case for thinking this movie still had a shot. I'm almost ready to erase it from all of my lists. Like, not even, like, the top 25. But uh, I'm going to see it and then make that decision. But you have seen it. Does this tra Have you seen this trailer? I haven't seen the trailer. I, I'm So I don't hate The Sun as much as other people do. I, I actually quite like it. I think I, I gave it, like, a low 8 out of 10. Um, I had some issues with it. But overall, I thought it was well put together, well acted. I thought the blocking was great. I thought the music was very good. Uh, I really loved Vanessa Kirby in the film. But yeah, no, it's not an Oscar contender. It's not. It's just not. It's not happening. Womp womp. You know, womp, it's, womp, womp. it's over. Um, but I think that's enough of talking trailers, talking all of this nonsense, because we have watched movies this week. We have watched quite a lot of movies this week. Actually, because you are uh, going to the film festival this week, we are recording another episode very, very shortly for next week because you've seen much more films this week than just what we're talking about today. But today we're focusing on the best actress race, and we're talking about Tar and about Till, both films that um, 
I think we have quite different opinions of. I think we're, we're kind of close on Tar, but let's start with Tar. So, okay. okay, I want to hear your take on Tar first. What? How do you feel overall on this one? So, I've heard the masses about this movie, about how this movie is great, this movie stinks, everywhere in between. And I fall in both those camps. I think the first hour or so of this movie is great. It's a very, very solid 9 out of 10. This Like the first 60, 70 minutes, I was like, oh, this is feeling like a breeze. I wonder how much is left because the movie felt like it was about to end. I was like, oh, this movie is like two and a half hours. Are we already about to end? I feel like I haven't been here that long. And then the movie keeps going. And the first half had such a clear artistic direction with its cinematography, its sound, its script, its blocking, just how it was telling its story. But this movie has such a clear grasp of what it wants to do. And then an action happens. And once said action happens, at least for me, this movie did a 180. It flipped itself. And all that tonal stuff I loved was all gone. And the second half of the movie was a complete mess to me. I never really checked my phone during movies and I looked down I was like oh I thought this movie was about to end and then like 30 minutes went by I looked down my phone I was like oh I still have an hour to go and more and more just kept happening I'm like where are we going and I do like what we ultimately get but I don't think you needed the 90 minutes to get to where it ultimately ends after the initial uh I guess you could say that whole first hour or so is act one and then act two kicks off and like act two just seems so overtly long and without really doing much that you could have got to act three so much quicker but i know there's there'll be other people who say act two is their favorite part of the movie and whatnot i don't want to ramble here for too long but like i mentioned before the cinematography is great i really like the sound where kate blanchett's phenomenal and even if people hate this movie i don't know how you come out of this movie without loving kate blanchett do i think she's winning best actress on the other hand that i'm more up in the air about than most people are i still think she's top two but we'll get into that here in a little bit matt you saw this movie a few weeks ago. We touched on that episode, but let's bring yeah. it back here and let's hear your thoughts after sitting with it for like a week or two. Here's my take. I gave it a six out of 10. I find it to be a very cold film, one that I can look at and go, yeah, that's good, but I don't like it that much. Mm -hmm. I appreciate a lot of what it's doing. I appreciate the layers. I appreciate the way that it it hides things about the main character the way that she hides things about herself. But again, I just found it to be so cold and so boring. Like, this is a movie that just felt circular and circular and circular. Like, how many times do we need to see Kate Blanchett go in a run? I, I feel like the film could have cut probably an hour and not really lost any substance whatsoever. Some people might argue with me that some of the nuances and some of the references to who Lydia Tarr really is below the facade, maybe that would have been lost if you lost some of those, um, you know, extra minutes, extra things, parts of her routine. But to me, it just made it feel like a total slog. And, okay, I will say... This film has two of my favorite scenes of the entire year, and they're the first two scenes of the film. The New Yorker interview scene, which is like a 10-minute one-take, basically. Um, uh, it's not a one-take. It's There's a few different angles, but it's an interview where Kate Blanchett is in character doing an interview with the real New Yorker interview guy, and that scene's brilliant because it really gives you a feeling of understanding who this character is, which is, of course, then unraveled through the rest of the film. And then there's the Juilliard scene, which is a one take. And that's that's my favorite scene of the year in any film. Anything. You know, Kate Blanchett going from just ridiculing these these kids in this class to playing piano perfectly and like the musicality and the performance in that. That that if that scene was the only part of her performance, I'd be like, yeah, hands down, Oscar. But personally, if I had to say, like, how I feel about her performance in general, uh, it's I feel the same way I do about the movie. I respect it more than I enjoy it. I didn't find much to connect with. I found her portrayal to be quite cold. And the character is cold, granted, so she was doing it right. But I just found so little to care about with her character here that I struggled to, like, really love. I feel like when I really love a performance, it's also in part 
because I find something really interesting and fascinating about the character. It's not always that I like the character, but I find something fascinating about the character. And I'm not really interested in Lydia Tarr here. You know, she, she might be a layered and complex individual, but I feel no reason to care about learning about her. But technically, it's an incredibly accomplished performance. She's doing everything she needs to be doing as an actor. I just don't connect with the role. Does that make sense? It makes sense to me because I'm kind of right there with you. Um, very much, I, I you mentioned you gave this a six. I gave I would give Tara a very low seven out of ten, just because of how much I did adore the first hour or so. Because those two scenes take up like 30, 40 minutes in yeah. runtime, and um, the pacing with those scenes, you never felt like you felt like oh, we've only been watching this for five minutes. Even after sitting through a seven minute opening title sequence of just the credits at the beginning of the movie. But it, it builds you up, and then you get in for the, the New Yorker scene, which is, like Matt said, brilliantly done, and then you get in the Juilliard scene, which is essentially a one-take. I'm sure there's some hidden camera moves in there where it wasn't actually one take, but it looks like it's a one-take, and it's done so well, and I just wish that, that style of um, the artistic feel and flavor that those two scenes brought was carried throughout the rest of the movie because after those two scenes, you get another about 30 minutes and then that's when the one, like, I guess, uh, tonal shift scene for me at least happens. And just all those styles and, like, filmmaking techniques just go out the window for me. And I don't know. I, I like this movie. I don't love this movie. I'm also cold to the second half. I just really like the first half, and I really don't like the second. It's essentially my feelings with Tar. Actually, here's my interesting thing. Despite the fact that I don't really particularly like the film, I would nominate this for Best Screenplay. The dialogue is layered and dense, and the way that they're speaking about music and all of these things is so, so interesting. So I'm, I'm really torn because, like, on a scene-by-scene -scene level, this film just constantly churns out just fantastic material. It is—the the dialogue is so rich, but— I just don't feel the same way about the rest of the film. I feel like this could be a film that I turn around on hardcore on a rewatch. Do you see it getting in for, for screenplay? At the moment, I think I have it for, um, I think I have Blanchett at two for actress. It's screenplay is five, six for me. Um, because I've, as I mentioned before, it's, it's, it's kind of a joke. It's kind of not a joke at this point. I have Bardo at five with, uh, with Tar as my five six. One of them I think is getting in for that artistic director flavor type screenplay. Just which one do they lean towards? And then I like I have Blanchett, I have screenplay maybe, and then I think Nina Hollis is like seven for supporting actress. And I think that's yeah. it's that's its slate. And then maybe picture like it's a picture at eleven. So it could easily get in there if uh, Bardo's uh, reactions are kind of fake because it's seeming right now a lot of people are liking Bardo. Its score online is going up and up and up. And there's other movies too like Elvis may not be for real or um, she said may not actually be a best picture contender. So there's space for Tar to get in there. I just don't know, will the why to love be there for picture outside of those specific categories like screenplay, like actress, like supporting actress? You just said that you have Blanchett at your number two spot in actress. I also have her at my number two spot in actress, but uh, I think we have different number ones. So let's talk about your number one. And I... I'm just going to let you know right now, Dylan, I'm about to rain all over your parade on this. That's so okay. I'll let you speak first, and then I'm I'm just going to shit all over this. I'm so sorry. Uh, I, I really, I'll, I'll try to go gently on it. <laughs> this, is what, this is what this is for. It's for a open discussion, uh, a thoughtful one, and one that helps us both get a better grasp of our thoughts on the movies afterwards. Because you mentioned a few weeks ago about accepting your L's or bringing your L's to the table. And I would like, at least for me, to bring my L's to the table for a till. This is a movie I openly said, like, I don't think this is going to be good. I think this is going to be Oscar bait, bad Oscar bait. And this is going to be this hot Oscar buzz and gets nowhere close to anything. But I'm here to say I think Till did an amazing job of balancing the ability to tell a heartbreaking story in a loving and caring fashion while not taking advantage to showcase trauma as a spectacle because bold claim right here, but future Oscar winner, Danielle Deadweiler shines and she's to me just does such an amazing job of showcasing the pain that she has to endure on the inside while also having scenes that let her showcase this on the outside. Is this 
the best performance of the year, that's up for debate. But this seems like the Oscar voters' best performance of the year, which we'll get into that a little bit more later. But for the movie itself, um, I thought the movie had very good pacing. It was two hours. It did not feel like two hours. We got through this movie very quickly, which is always good for me, at least in a biopic type movie, because those tend to have lulls where you're like, where are we going? This story is moving so slow. Let's get through this. Let's get to the end. But this movie, I thought, did a great job with its pacing. Going into technicals for this movie, I mentioned the editing. I thought the cinematography had it's moments where it shined. Other moments, it wasn't the greatest, but it had some very beautiful moments, kind of how I feel about Tar as well. And I really like the score in this movie. And um, that's what I'm really interested to hear your take, because it seems like we're usually kind of opposites on scores, where you may really like a score in one movie where I don't, and then another movie, I really like its score where you don't. So I'll be interested to hear your take there. This sometimes can be seen as a negative, but I think this is a positive of movies that are made for like classrooms or for teaching, for history. And I feel like this movie is one that would fit very well in like a curriculum. I know I'm rambling here, but the last thing I just want to say about Till is I was very, I came in with very low expectations even after hearing a lot of pundits say how much they really enjoyed this movie, they really enjoyed the performance. And I was like, there's, there's no way. The trailers just don't look good. Like nothing with this movie's like bringing it to life. And then I saw, I was like, this was really good. And um, I, I'm going to butcher the name if I tried, but uh, the director of the movie, did a I think a fantastic job of its with its camera angles because there's a lot of times where I feel like the camera just lingers just for the right amount of time it doesn't stay too long it doesn't cut too soon um yeah okay I before I get into my thoughts I'll actually just counteract one thing you say with part of the reason why I really hated this movie and why it actually made me like viscerally angry when I left um and that is so you say this would be a great film to teach in, in classrooms as, uh, to show what happened. And the reason I disagree with that is because it, in many ways, buys into the falsified version of the story which um, Carolyn Bryant told. In the courtroom, Carolyn Bryant says, oh, he grabbed me and he said, like, oh, I've been with white women before, um, which was you know, probably after like a couple decades accepted as that was a lie, but it was still held that he whistled at her. That has also been recently confirmed to be a lie because Carolyn Bryant was, um, she was interviewed for a book and she said that he never whistled at her. He was completely innocent. He didn't do anything and they just picked him out. He could have been anyone. And so for them to prominently feature him catcalling her, you know, as much as it might be very respectful to the rest of the story, that hit me in a way that felt very, very negative. Um, otherwise, though, OK, I'll just say right off the bat, um, I felt like this was just like the epitome of bland Oscar bait. Um, I'll, I'll say on the opposite side from you, very early in the year, I just checked my old Oscar predictions. So between March to May, I had Till in my Best Picture Top 10. It even got up to number four for me at some points. I had uh, Chinanye Chukwu in my, best, uh, in my Best Director 5 because I'd seen Clemency, and although I wasn't a huge fan of Clemency, I think even on the show I talked about how I'm, I'm very excited for Till and, and thought that it would be something special, and then I saw the trailer and felt different about it. And how I felt about the trailer is how I feel about the film. I do feel like it's Oscar bait. I do feel like everything feels like it's high key, overblown lighting. It just, it feels so slick, but not in a good way. I really, really hated it. I'm going to be honest. I only liked Danielle Deadweiler in one scene. There's only one scene that I liked her in. It was the courtroom scene. It just, it looks like there's so much pain in her at that moment in, in this time that even her as an actor, uh, she can't control what her face is doing, what her body's doing. Um, and I felt that in this. But otherwise, every single scene just felt like hollow Oscar bait. It felt like every single moment with Danielle Deadweiler was like the writers, the director, the, the costume designer, everyone being like, we're going to get her an Oscar. I was on the opposite. I really like Deadweiler here. Um, the courtroom scene would probably... It would not be my favorite. The only scene I really did not f really enjoy from her, which I thought was like very much overreacting, was uh, her screaming scene uh, when um, 
the cast with the train. Off the train. Yeah. yeah. That scene took me out a little bit. Um, I was like, this is very overacting. What not? Obviously, I'm someone who's never been in that situation, so I don't know what the natural reaction there is like sort of thing. Yeah, I think that's um, a hard scene to of, do for any actor. So we did this with Tar, so I think we should do it with Till. Uh, Oscar chances, obviously best actress for Deadweiler. Yeah, I she's feel in. Like even she's with, in. Yeah, even with not liking the movie, you can still see that that's most likely a nomination. Do you, th- though, see anything else? Because we've mentioned before, Adapted seems weak. Is this something that you think from an Oscar voters perspective could get into that Adapted 5 or maybe song? Or do you think this is Deadweiler or bust? Um, I think it can get sung. I, I took it out of my song. I stayed for the credits to listen to the song. I, it's not remarkable at all. It's like, uh, it's, it's fine. It feels like every other song. I don't see why they'd nominate this song over like the woman King's exact same song, for example, which like, there's this trend recently of, um, films that are trying to be Oscar contenders that have this sort of like social issue R and B song at the end of them. And, uh, yeah, this kind of, it was that with the trial of the Chicago seven with Judas, with one night in Miami, with, um, and with this, with the woman King. And, um, I didn't like this song, but I, I could see it getting in. I'm not going to rule out for picture because I could see a world where like the stars align and this gets AFI and NBR and, you know, a surprise globe nomination and just kind of keeps going, keeps going until it gets into Best Picture, but I, I don't think it's very likely at this point. Mm-hmm. So if I were to personally predict nominations, I would say it's just Dead Weiler. No, I feel you there. I also think it's probably just Dead Weiler. Uh, we mentioned before the songwriter for this song was also the songwriter for Judas uh, in the mm-hmm. Black Messiah song, Fight For You. I very much did not like that song. <laughs> and I thought this song, I didn't actually hear this song. Uh, my theater actually uh, was very vocal during the credits. So I had to go actually listen to the song again to be like, okay, let's actually hear this in like a controlled environment. But um, yeah, I still think this is probably just Dead Weiler. I could see a case of this movie really does catch one because if we look at the Rotten Tomato score right now, this got an A plus cinema score. It got, I think it has a 99 or 98 on Rotten Tomatoes. And so it's really connecting with critics. And um, so this could have, like we said, there's a route where it could get in a screenplay or could get a picture. Right now though, I just see actress but if we're going to the actress versus actress contention that's when i think it's gonna be most interesting because both these movies could just be the lead actress or another package could come with and that's how you see the wide support for those films is if tar ends up with three nominations while till just gets one blanchette's probably one if till gets like two or three and tar just gets one then dead deadweiler's probably one Okay, so now I know you wanted to talk a little bit about the uh, race between these two actors, right? And and who is going to come out on top? Who's favored by the statistics? Uh, but first off, I just want to hear from you. Who would you prefer to win? Who would be your vote? Is it just between those two or anyone from this year at all? Um, let's do both. Between those two and then anyone from this year. Between those two, I would go with Deadweiler. Um, I felt like her performance was more, I don't know, I just, like we mentioned before with Tar and Blanchett, I really appreciate what Blanchett's doing. It wasn't really for me, um, but she's doing great work. Like she's speaking multiple languages. She is conducting. She is powerful. She is confident. I just felt like uh, Deadweiler's performance was more well-rounded across all. But I feel like both would be good winners. I don't feel like either would be a bad winner. However, if I'm going with everyone, then it would be Michelle Yeoh for everything ever all at once. Mm-hmm. Okay, uh, so I'm going to give the altering opinion. I would go Blanchett uh, over Deadweiler. Uh, and the reason I'd go Blanchett uh, would be not just because I didn't l- like Deadweiler in it. Yeah. Um, I do, I have Blanchett at my number two in Actress right now, I believe. I might actually have her at number three at the moment, Um, but I think I have her at number two. And the reason being that although I don't connect with her character, it is undeniable that she is incredibly technically capable, and she's doing so much. Like you mentioned, she's playing music, she's conducting, she's speaking multiple languages, she is embodying a character and giving history to a character, Um, which I find very interesting. The only thing that I don't love about the performance is that I just, I really struggle to find a reason to care about this character or to want to understand this character deeper. Um, Yeah, Uh, but 
like you said, Michelle Yeoh would be my pick. And if I'm being honest, Michelle Yeoh is still my pick to win Best Actress. And actually, looking at your stats, I'll let you do the stats, and then we'll make a case for Michelle Yeoh as well, because I think the odds actually are kind of in her favor a little bit. I think he may be onto something as well. I more focus, like you mentioned, for these stats we're going to do here with Blanche and Dead Wilders and say where the people are involved with the films here. I still think that Yo has a very solid shot. That all just depends on what is the everything ever all at once craze? What is the rave for it going forward? Does it does it mm-hmm. click like you're expecting it to or does it not hit those highs that we expect? But that's what the uh, the season's about to come into because we're about to get into a lot of critic strips. But looking yeah. just at the last 10 best actress winners, I'll try to go through this a little quick because we have had a longer episode today. Uh, last year was uh, Jessica Chastain for the eyes of Tammy Faye and this was her first win win in her third nomination and one thing i want to look at with all of these people is are they playing someone in real life or are they playing a fictitious character because we see this in all the acting categories there's usually a little bit of a bias to people who are performing either in a biopic or playing someone that was a real life person and as we see last year the winner was a real person however this film did not get in the picture but it was nominated in two categories and it won both of those categories the year before was francis mcdormand and nomadland um this was her third win. Uh, she was not playing a real character, but this was a Best Picture winner, and it went three out of six for its nominations. The year before, which I think is a very good uh, counterpart for Danielle Deadweiler, theoretically could be Judy uh, for Renee Zellweger, because this is a film that did get nominated in two categories, very similar to what Till could be. It's a movie that did not get into Best Picture, which Till is not looking like it's going to get into. And it was also this person's first Best Actress win. And they were portraying a real life character. This someone I think fits Dead Wild a little bit more later, but this is one that is a very recent example of da- Daniel Dead Wilder's case to a Best Actress win. The year before was Olivia Coleman in the favorite. This was her first nomination. She played a real person. There was a Best Picture nominee, and this was its film's only win out of ten categories, which is kind of crazy going back to because the favorite's a movie I personally would award in a lot of places, but the Academy not so much. 2017, we have Frances McDormand again. This was her second win for another fictitious character and a Best Picture nominee, and this film also won supporting actor. The year before was Emma Stone and La La Land. This was her first win, second nomination, fictitious character. Best Picture winner for about 10 seconds, and this movie won six awards. So very, very loved film across the board. The year before was Brie Larson, another counterpart for Danielle Deadweiler because this was her first nomination. This was in a fictitious movie that did break into picture and was nominated in four categories, including screenplay, which is something that Till is looking to get, but I don't think will get at the end of the day. 2014, though, is Danielle Deadweiler's, I think, best correlation to anyone in the last 10 years is Julianne Moore and Still Alice because this was her first win and it was the only nomination for this movie. And it won, obviously. And this is a uh, that's a film that uh, wasn't very much loved across the board, not to the level that Till is at the moment, critically at least. And But it's a film that was very much garnered for its lead performance, which is what Till is getting right now. And I think Till's chances are between Zellweger and Judy and uh, Julianne Moore and Still Alice. It's either going to get two or three nominations to its name because it could get song and it could maybe get screenplay, but screenplay I think is very low. A lot would have to go right for screenplay. Or it could just be Deadweiler. 2013, though, is where we have Kate Blanchett's last win. Um, this was her first Best Actress win and her second overall. She was playing a fictitious character, and this film got three nominations, which are very similar to what Tar could get this year. It was an actress, supporting actress, and original screenplay. Kate Blanchett could have a very similar slate this year with Tar because, as we mentioned before, Tar, Nina Haas could get in for supporting actress, as we saw at the Gothams. Screenplay is battling there for, I would say, most people would be between number three and number six or seven because you could throw in Triangle of Sadness, you could throw in Bardo, you could throw in some other movies in that little range for the original screenplay. A very tough category this year. And then in 2012, we had Jennifer Lawrence for Silver Lines Playbook, fictitious, Best Picture nominated though, and it was its only win out of eight nominations. So if we look at stats from all these people, Three of our 10 winners played real life women. Uh, that's something that very much does not favor my claim before of the Oscars really liking biopics. While they usually get in for nominations, they don't always win. So this one kind of goes more to Yo and Blanchett because they're both playing uh, not real people. However, what is in Blanchett or what is not in Blanchett but it isn't in Deadweiler and Yo's favor is eight of these 10 are first time winners. 
And the only two that weren't was McDormand winning twice and Kate Blanchett herself. So who knows? McDormand won twice. So to make that stat still seem accurate, Blanchett could win again. Um, mm-hmm. Six films made in the best picture at the moment. Uh, Yo is the only one in my personal predictions that would be in a best picture nominee. But I know a lot of people have uh, Tar making best picture and as Matt mentioned, there are some people who do believe that Till can make it to Best Picture because of it has it has an avenue to get there. And then four of these films also won in other categories. And um, that bodes not so much for Till and Tari because as we've looked at throughout when we talked with both of them, they're not number one or number two in any other category, whether it is song, whether it is screenplay, supporting actors, even director uh, for Tari because some, there's some um, buzz for Todd Field there. However, this goes more to what Matt was saying before. If we're looking at Michelle Yeoh, that has a chance in screenplay, has a chance in supporting actor, and has a chance in picture. And lastly, only one winner was from, or only one winner's win was its only nomination. And we mentioned that above of Julianne Moore and still Alice, which would be a very much Danielle Deadweiler type situation here. She could get song, but as we mentioned, could maybe, that would really show just how much love there is for the movie and not just Deadweiler. So, but the biggest thing that I think could play into the narrative of both Yo and Deadweiler, but also is a very uh, condemning or damning stat for them as well because it does not show that the stats are on their side but in the last 10 years uh, zero winners were uh, people of color uh, they were all white women and that yeah. fits Kate Blanchett but that does not fit Deadweiler that does not fit Yo and if you want to bring other contenders in the scene as well um, Viola Davis had a shot with Ma Rainey she still didn't win there, but she's up again this year for The Woman King and Naomi Aki for I Want to Dance with Somebody, which is someone who I previously had at number one to break that stat. But if we're looking at it here, uh, it's not looking in the favor. I know I just threw a lot of numbers, a lot of stats at everyone out there. But Matt, do you have any questions after seeing just the last 10 years of Best Actress rounded up in just a few small statistical categories? Yeah, I, I like the statistical categories that you did here. And the thing that uh, I'm really noticing is yeah, it's it's so much more likely that it's going to go to a first-time winner. Um, and you are right that so much more of the time in this category, they have gone to fictitious characters. We hear a lot of people talking about, oh, they always go for the biopics, they always go for the biopics, they always, you know, Oscars just eat up the real-life people. But clearly that's not the case, um, because the only real people here are... Olivia Colman playing Queen Anne, which was not even a, a, close to a real portrayal of that character. So I would also say that was a fictional character. The only two real biopic characters here are Renee Zellweger and Jessica Chastain. It um, just so happened they were two of the last three winners. Yeah, it just it just so happened. So that heavily favors Blanchett and uh, Yo. But here's my argument for Yo. What did we both say? At the beginning of this. We both said that Yo would be our personal picks. We both said that Yo would be our personal picks. And what have we seen in previous years? Um, oh, well, Chadwick Boseman's probably going to win, but I have to vote for my favorite. I'm going with Anthony Hopkins. Kate Blanchett, she deserves it. She deserves a third Oscar. She's incredible here. But you know what? I just have to go with my personal favorite. I, my heart is with Michelle Yo. And there's my argument. I think that's going to be where a lot of people lie. Is a lot of people are going to say, I respect the hell out of what Blanchett is doing. I think that her performance in Tar is one of the greatest pieces of acting ever. However, I preferred everything ever all at once. No, I definitely, um, I, I like that argument because that's what I would like to see win as well. Yeah, I'd love to see it happen. I, that doesn't mean it will happen. This is just a theory because this is, uh, this is what we do. We predict. And at this point, I think that we're going to see um, a split between these three actors among critics groups. Probably Blanchett is going to be the number one critics poll, then Yo, then Deadweiler. I'd assume when we get to the Golden Globes, um, it's going to be a showdown between Blanchett and Deadweiler in actress drama. Um, but... I would actually, I think I'd lean towards Deadweiler at the Globes. At SAG, I would say it's probably a battle between Yo and Deadweiler. BAFTA, it's 
it's probably between Blanchett and Yo. Um, probably towards Blanchett there. Basically, this year, this category is going to be quite hard to predict. It's going to be a little chaotic. Which is what we love. It's fun. It's fun that way. Um, but anyways, we are going to get into, as always, we end with predictions. And this week, something we didn't touch about in the news is that Black Panther Wakanda Forever released the first single from the film. So I'm going to give my um, list of best original song. At number five, I've got a little, little Diane Warren jingle called Applause from Tell It Like a Woman. Um, we haven't heard this song yet. We do not know what this song is yet, but it's Diane Warren. And every year we are taught a valuable lesson of do not doubt Diane Warren. She'll get in for four good days. She'll get in for the life ahead. She'll get in for whatever she does because she is Diane Warren and fuck you. That's how it is. That's what it is. That's what it clearly always will be. Uh, at number four, um, I have not been able to figure out if the Matilda movie has an original song in it. I don't know, um, but I would hope it does, because if it does, it is number four here. But that one will probably move out of my top five and be replaced by the song from Till, Stand Up. Um, because, I again, I don't know if Matilda has one, but if it does, it's in the top five. At number three, moving down from number one, because... I have been saying from the beginning, oh, Top Gun's winning three Oscars. It's winning song, editing, and sound. But now we can count song out. It is not winning song. We said on a previous episode as well that the stats are against Gaga for winning a second Oscar for song because pop stars don't win second Oscars unless they're Elton John. Um, and hold my hand, it's not winning anymore. It's not winning. Um, it is a song that I was never very passionate about, and it's good enough for a nomination. I do not think it will get a win. Number two, I've got Ciao Papa from Pinocchio. Uh, another song we haven't heard yet, but we know it exists. We know that they're campaigning it, and we know that there has been acclaim and praise for the music in Pinocchio. And that is my argument for it in number two. Uh, it's also another way that they could possibly reward Guillermo del Toro because he did write the uh, lyrics to the song while Alexandre Desplat composed it. Um, and I think that this is this is a big one. And if our number one fails, which I don't think it will, uh, Chow Papa will take its place. And number one is Lift Me Up from Black Panther, Wakanda Forever. Rihanna is back. I, I'd love to hear your thoughts on the song too, but personally, as much as I would have loved to hear something a little bit more exciting and enthused like All the Stars was, which was, you know, All the Stars was a bop. Lift Me Up is basically the opposite of a bop. It is a ballad that, you know, it hits deeply. It's beautifully orchestrated. The guitar on it, I think, is very powerful. And I can picture this being the performance of the Oscars that makes everyone cry as there's, like, pictures of Chadwick Boseman all over the place. And I think that this is going to carry through the year. I think it's going to leave people... It's the credit song of Wakanda Forever. I think it's going to leave people, like, in the theater just going, oh, my God. Yeah, this is this is it. Um, but yeah, I, I'll just toss out some other possibilities here. I'm not counting out Nobody Like You from Turning Red. Not very confident in it, though. Keep Rising from The Woman King. I would prefer that to be the, um, the social justice R&B song rather than Stand Up from Till. I really like to keep rising in The Woman King. There might be a song and I want to dance with somebody. We don't know that yet. As well, there is This Is A Life from Everything Ever All At Once, which could come along if it overperforms. We also don't know if Avatar The Way Of Water has a song because the first one did, which got nominated. There is also Natu Natu from RRR, which is getting a lot of traction. It's getting pumped up at this point. So we could see that get into the best uh, song five, but I'm really not too sure. But what, what do you think about this top five and what do you think about Lift Me Up? So I'll start off with Lift Me Up. Uh, this is a song, I'm a huge Rihanna fan, so I was really excited to hear it. I kind of agree. It's kind of just a, it's, it's, it's a song. It's, it's a movie and credit song. And she even kind of acknowledged this 
like on like Twitter because she was like, oh, do you expect me to come back with this? Like, no, we're, we got more coming, but this is just like the tease for what's to come. So, but I still think uh, we've mentioned what is Wakanda Forever's Oscar chances. And regardless if it's a picture player or not, regardless if it's a visual effects player or a blow the line, this is in. And looking at our field right now, I don't see what else can win. Because like you, I've never been high on Hold My Hand. In fact, outside of like the Oscars, I've not heard anyone talk about the song since it came out. What yeah. song from Top Gun have they been talking about? The the freaking One Republic song. That's like a top 10 song like the <laughs> charts right now. I still think it would be really funny if that somehow gets nominated over the Gaga one and like the Gaga stands like freak out. Um, but I, I like your list. Um, I was trying to look on the Netflix for your consideration page, but their website is so hard to use on desktop. Uh, I was not mm-hmm. able to even see like categories for stuff. So I wasn't able to check if there was one for Matilda. I know that they used to have like under Bardo or under white noise, they would have like these people in this category. But when I just went to look on a Safari, it wouldn't pop up anything. Once you click the movie, um, our lists are a little bit different, but just because we're so far out in this category, uh, nothing's really all too set. Um, I don't have the Pinocchio song in my five, but I easily think of that movie catches on. Uh, it, easily could get in here. I still have nobody like you from turning red. Why I don't think it's winning. Uh, as you mentioned before, the pop stars don't win twice. Uh, Billie Eilish just has some sort of hold on voters. Every time she puts out something, the Grammys always go for it. So maybe the voter base at the Oscars is the same. And she just gets those coattail nominations off of name alone. I do have Diane Warren in my five though. So we are similar in that. Uh, I think that your list has a good variance of all stuff because we never really see five of the same type of songs. Like when there's like, you mentioned the social justice songs, we never get all of them. We usually get like one, maybe two. And I think it's good to take a stand on which one that you think it could be, if it's going to be stand up, if it's going to be keep rising, if it could be whatever. Uh, I feel like one could make it in, but um, Diane Warren, she's definitely in. I feel like we've we've been wrong enough about Diane Warren in the past where we've been like, oh, the song sucks. She's not getting in. But she always proves us wrong. Anyways, let's move on to your category. You are here to talk about actress. I'll make a bold take out there for people right now. There's seven people you could have in Best Actress for five spots. If you don't have, if you have someone not in that seven, you're crazy. And I'm all for crazy predictions. But if you have anyone outside of the top seven I have listed here, I would love to know your uh, reasoning. However, I still have the list of 10, and my list of 10 starts off with someone that uh, um, I uh, have in my Globe Drama 5. She's not there anymore, but she was in my Globe Drama 5 last time we talked. Uh, was uh, Ana de Armas and Is she getting nominated? No. But she's going to get some votes, just not enough for a nomination. I have Taylor Russell on Bones and all because we have seen there is support for this performance. Will she get in? Probably not. Number eight is Olivia Coleman in Empire of Light. I... Uh, I understand why people have this, but if this movie's not anywhere close to picture, she's nowhere close to actress. I don't care about how she gets in for everything. As we saw last year, Lost Daughter still got a screenplay, still got a supporting actress nomination. She wasn't a lone nominee. She's never been a lone nominee for her movies. Even The Father, she got in as a supporting with Hopkins, with picture, with screenplay. And uh, that brings us to our top seven. Seven right now, I have Viola Davis. I understand why people have her in the five. I just think, I mentioned Various episodes. I think every episode since this movie's come out. This sh- movie should be in categories. I just don't see it making it the whole season. I feel like mm-hmm. it's going to get replaced by other stuff. And it's not going to be forgotten about because I still think it could show up in certain categories. I don't think this would be a, the, as big of a player as it probably should be. Number six is my bold take from our film ball draft. that had everyone made fun of me. I said, this person's winning best actress because... Why not? And I don't even have her in my five anymore. That's not me acting for I want to dance with somebody. She has fallen out of my five. I know. Uh, my second L of the day, per se. Uh, but number five, I have everyone's favorite. Let's throw her in supporting actress because it makes things easier. But guess what? Confirm now. She's a lead. Margot Robbie Babylon. At one point, this was people's uh, easy. She's going to win her first Oscar. She's due. She, Margot Robbie's like 30. She's not overdue for an Oscar. Um that brings us to our top four, which I can see a winning case for all four of these. You already mentioned three of them before, but you can't write out Michelle Williams and Fablemans, even though she is yeah. a supporting actress in the lead category. She's going to show up somewhere. You mentioned how Globes could be Deadweiler versus Yo or Deadweiler versus Blanchett. I think Michelle Williams is going to win the Globe for drama. Um, really? 
Bold. If they go fable, if they go fablements for picture, she comes along. If they don't go fablements for picture, she doesn't win. But I think it's a it's a two for two sort of thing. Uh, they're mm. either the gloves are either gonna love fablements and it's like gonna sweep, or they're not gonna love fablements. And we have Maverick, we have Till, we have um, someone else in director sort of thing winning. And then that brings us to our top three. I honestly think you can put these three in any order and it works out fine. At the moment, I have Deadweiler 1, Blanchett 2, Yo 3. But after the discussion with Matt here on the episode, I kind of want to have Yo at 1. I just don't know where to go about this category because, as he mentioned, this category is going to be so fluid all season. It's going to be uh, this crazy. Could be, <laughs> it could be very similar to 2020 where we have someone win Globe, someone win SAG, someone win BAFTA, and someone different win the Oscar. And we could have different winners at every ceremony, and that's my favorite type of season. I don't like seasons where the same person wins every award. I like um, I like uh, spreading it out, make it make it crazy, make it spur That way, it's not just like oh, I went twenty two out of twenty three for my Oscar predictions. No, we want to have we want to have crazy sporadicness. Yeah. Yeah. I love that. I'm always drawn to it. Okay. I, I like your, your top. I like your top five. Um, I heavily disagree with Ana Diarmas being here. Uh, I would also say, I think it's quite bold that you've got Taylor Russell in. I know that there's a lot of praise for her. I just don't think the Academy is going to get this movie at all. So if I were to suggest two replacements for these two, it would be Zoe Kazan in She Said, which we, we now have confirmed that she is a lead in the film. Um, and I would say that uh, people are going to be looking at that movie, even if it's not a Best Picture contender, people are going to be looking at She Said. And I think at the very least, um, I don't know if it's above your number eight spot, which is Olivia Coleman. I would personally say so, but I'd say... Zoe Kazan is definitely over Taylor Russell and Anna Diarmas. I'd also say that now that we know Rooney Mara is being campaigned in lead for Women Talking, yeah, she doesn't really have a shot because she is... It's such an ensemble film that it's hard to argue that a lead actor should be nominated for it. But again, the film is going to be bigger. It is at least over Taylor Russell and Ana de Armas. No, I, I definitely feel you there. I still think once I Want to Dance with Somebody comes out, regardless of what critics think about this movie, I think Aki's going to get a bump. Two, I think that's to the point of a win now. No, but I think she could easily be a top five contender, get in over Robbie, getting over Williams, or even if Till or uh, Michelle Yeoh falls off a little bit. The only person I think who's safe for a nomination is Blanchett. I, I don't see a world where she misses. Her name alone will get her in. Like what people are saying for Olivia Coleman, like, oh, she never misses. Blanchett sometimes does miss, but not for a performance of this magnitude. The one fight back I will have for uh, Kazan and Mara is you mentioned watching the She Said trailer. I also saw the She Said trailer again today. Zoe Kazan seems so bland in the trailer. She has no facial reactions or anything. So just off that alone, I didn't put yeah. her in my 10. I see the movie in like four days, so I can actually, or not four, like five days. So I can actually like um, confirm or deny. Like I said before, my nine, 10, and eight are not people I think who could get nominated. They're just people who I think will receive a portion of the votes. So like, I think mm. Ana de Almas has no shot of nomination. I think there will be people who vote for her. Taylor Russell has no shot mm. of nomination. There will be people who vote for her. Olivia Coleman maybe could fight her way somehow, but I don't think we'll be, but she's going to get votes sort of thing. And uh, Rooney Mara for women talking. Yeah, I could see her making the 10, but at the same time, everyone who talks about the movie, she's never a name that comes out of it. They never mention. Oh, Rooney Mara is my favorite. I would nominate Rooney Mara. It's always, Oh, it's Claire Foy. It's um, Jesse Buckley. It's Ben Wishaw. Those are our favorites, but they never mentioned Mara. So yes, while she is alone in this category without any competition from her fellow ensemble mates, I just don't see anyone ever talk about her to get her here. But she probably is theoretically, like if you're making like a likelihood of nominations ahead of Russell, ahead of Diamas. But I think at the end of the day, those two will probably have more votes on a said ballot than Mara or Kazan. Okay, interesting. Also, I will before we move on to best picture for the week, uh, there is one person that we know who has been saying that Rooney Mara was their favorite in Women Talking, and it's Arno. Um, Arno is came out of Women Talking and said, yeah, Rooney Mara, hands down, she's a lead, and she's my favorite in the film. So Interesting. Then I apologize. I must have missed <laughs> that. Uh, no, it's it's interesting, though, because you're, uh, Arno is the only person that I've heard say, like, Rooney Mara is the standout in particular. Um, 
because yeah, everyone else has been Buckley, Foy, and some people say Ben Wisha. I have no idea what they're talking about. I like him. I like him, but like he's he just doesn't do enough in the film. He's silent for most of it. Um, mm-hmm. But yeah, I mean Foy for me. Oh my god. Okay, now we're gonna get into the best picture rankings, and I'm gonna drop mine. I can't remember the last time I dropped mine on this podcast actually, so. I'm actually pretty excited to to talk a little bit about my best picture rankings right now because we we've done a few weeks of Golden Globes and everything and um, yeah so I'll start at number twenty I'll kind of rush through the bottom echelon of the list so I've got twenty Triangle of Sadness reviews have heard it um, what's it going to get nominated for where else is it going to get nominated precursors are not going to like it except BAFTAs. Uh, 19, Black Panther Wakanda Forever. Re- reactions are out there about what was expected. Uh, I want to see reviews before. like it, it needs to be like in the high 80s, low 90s to get into Best Picture contention. Um, but, you know, it's possible it'll get some crafts. I already said that it has a win coming up with song. Number 18, Decision to Leave. I rewatched this this week. I am reconsidering. I do think that this probably will get into Best International Feature. I think it's in my top 10 for Best Director. Um, I don't see this getting into picture, but I think there is a world. It would kind of need a Drive My Car style run to get there, where it would need to hit some of the trifecta. It would need to, like, like lest we forget, Drive My Car was Obama's favorite movie of last year, and that's where the awards hype started, as people started talking like, oh my god, Barack Obama put this at the top of his list. Do I see him doing that with the decision to leave? No, but I think there's a path. Number 17, All Quiet on the Western Front, has dropped this week. Uh, It is on Netflix. We will be talking about it next week's episode. Um, This is one that I've definitely seen falling reactions as it's come out. The uh, Metascore is not going up. It's kind of just staying where it is. And I've seen a lot of mixed reactions from audience. So while people like me and many of the other TIFF people still say this is like hands down the best war movie of... uh, the last decade, many others are not feeling that way. So it is it is dropping. I, I think the the chances of this being Netflix's big contender, it's, it's lower. Number 16, I got Till. I don't like it, so I'm not putting it close to the top 10 out of stubbornness. Uh, number 15, got The Woman King. Um, I still feel like there's a chance, but I feel like there's stuff against it. So, eh. uh, 14, Bardo. Same thing, you know, the reactions are... Um, the reactions are going up. They're getting better and better. Could it get into uh, Best Director? Yeah, it could. Directors like this film. I still argue that. But ultimately, I don't know. I think that Netflix is going to realize that they're wasting their money if they prioritize this too much, which leads us to the next Netflix movie at number 13, Glass Onion. Uh, They are pushing this one. They're going to push it hard. They're going to push it very, very hard. And that is worth noting. Do I think that it will get into Best Picture? No, I think it'll make PGA, you know, Globes, and then fall short of Best Picture. So I I don't think even, no matter how much they push this one, I don't think it's getting into Picture. Number 12, Elvis. You've got it much higher than I do. Um, I still don't think Austin Butler's winning. I've actually shifted my cards. I think it's going to be Colin Farrell winning, which leads me to number 11, The Whale. Uh, I don't have this in Best Picture either, but if it gets into Best Picture, Brendan Fraser's winning. And um, if it gets into Best Picture, it's exclusively because of Brendan Fraser. Number 10, Pinocchio. Uh, This is actually why I've been so excited to talk about Best Picture for a while, because I couldn't include this in in my Globes nominations. No, I couldn't. I couldn't put Pinocchio in there. And then, like, last week you did your predictions, and you had Pinocchio so low that it hurt my soul. And then we've had Arno in the show in the past, and, you know, I wasn't able to talk about it then. But Pinocchio is screened. It's got a 93 on Metacritic. It's one of the highest rated movies of the year by critics. This is a film that we're, we're seeing the love pouring in for it. We know they love Del Toro. He's going on a massive campaign talking about how animation is film. Animation is not for kids. Like, it's not just for kids. This is not a film for kids, but it's a film that kids can enjoy. Um... And I think that's going to help the film. I think it's really going to help the film all the way along that Guillermo del Toro is out there pounding the ground. He's pounding the table saying, 
uh, look at this film, take it seriously. I know that you don't take animation seriously, but please do. This film is so much more than just uh, your your average like Disney movie. That's gonna help him. And it is my number 10. Uh, number nine, Avatar The Way of Water. I don't need to say too much more about that. Uh, it's a spectacle, it's gonna get in. Probably. Number eight, she said it's falling, but you know, I want to hear your reaction about it to, before I make a decision about where it's going to land. And number seven, I've got Tar. Um, I do think that this is getting multiple nominations. I think it's getting screenplay. I think it's getting actress. I think it's very possible. I, I think I have it at number six for director. I, I see this being in. Uh, I think that there's a solid group of devotees that are just going to push this the shit out of this film. It's going to be there no matter what. Number six, I've got Babylon. Babylon dropping a little bit. I do not see this as a top five contender. Um, I see there being screener issues, which is going to impact it at precursors. I see the three hour runtime, which has made it so that I'm like, oh, this is not getting in for editing. Um, it's going to hurt it overall. Uh, I think that it's going to be a controversial film to say the least, and I have lost confidence in it being a top five contender at this point. So that brings me to the top five. We've got Top Gun Maverick, number five. It is dropping a little bit. It just lost one of its wins. So sorry, Top Gun Maverick. I didn't really like you that much anyways. Number four, got Women Talking, which I've had number three for a while now, but um, I just don't know if it will have the passion to get to a win as much as I would love it to, because I love this film. Number three, this is pretty undeniable at this point. The Banshees of Inisherin is one of the best reviewed films of the year. People absolutely adore this film. It is going to pick up a ton of wins. It is number two for original screenplay, which is actually really interesting because of what I'll talk about with the next film. But yeah, Banshees of Inisherin, this is number three. Now, I, I feel like it's pretty undeniably number three. I think Colin Farrell's winning actor. Um, also, wait, sidebar, when are you seeing Banshees? Um, I'm not sure yet because I think it opens in Richmond next uh, when I'll be at the film festival. So I probably won't be able to see okay, it until so, that Monday or Tuesday afterwards. So next week you'll see it. That's that's cool. Um, right on. Yeah, and then number two, The Fablemans. Like I said, this is still a front runner right now. But uh, will it be the front runner at the end of the season? No. And like I just said, not uh, only is The Fablemans not winning original screenplay, it's not even the runner up for original screenplay. The Fablemans is winning director for Spielberg, and what else can it win? Nothing else. Um, I think this is just going to fall as the year goes on. I think we're going to get to the Globes, and it's. I don't think it's going to win the Globe. Um, and I think it's all downhill from there. But for now, yes, it's number two. Um, and then number one, it's Black Adam. Surprise, surprise, it's everything ever all at once. Um, I'm not going to talk about this. I rant about it so much every single time. Ta-da! That's my number uh, everything of best picture. But yeah, my biggest takeaway, I finally put Pinocchio in my top ten. Um, I, and I'm confident in it at this point. I feel good about Pinocchio getting in. Inspired. I, I really like it. While I don't have Pinocchio in my ten, I'm all for being bold with your predictions because what's what's the fun if you're not being bold? The one, I think, funniest thing about your list is you mentioned uh, how... Like, you don't have Till higher due to you not liking it. You have Till higher than me on Best Picture list. So, um, I think I have Till at 19 right now. Uh, yeah, I feel like I'm just being, like, a little pessimistic as well. That I'm like, oh my god. I can see that people are really liking this a lot more than mm -hmm. I am. And, you know, so I, I, I have it higher than I want it to be. But maybe not as high as it should be. Interesting. Oh, well, I'm lower than you, so if it should be yeah, higher than interesting. the fan of it's lower too. But yeah, for for your 10, uh, we have eight of the 10 the same. I have Elvis instead of Tar, and I have Bardo instead of Pinocchio. But other than that, we're pretty much similar, just different orders of everything. And I'll be really excited, not next episode, but the episode after that. Because by that episode, I would have seen She Said, I would have seen Banshees, which I had Banshees uh even before I see it, uh, spoiler alert, I had Banshees winning original screenplay. But, so uh, we'll see once I see it if I still back that claim up. But uh, 
I think you're you're on the right track if you're comment about Banshees rising and Fableman's falling. Oh yeah, Banshees is rising so hard, and I've even seen some people say that it could win Best Picture, and I would still say no uh, because Three Billboards was nominated, and we know my theory. It can't win uh, because people are going to compare it to Three Billboards and say, "Oh, I like Three Billboards better." Which, like, that's that's how I feel. Like, and I know a lot of people say it's better than Three Billboards, and I know a lot of people say it's not Three Billboards. So, you know, um, but undeniably, it is it is one of the most acclaimed films of the year, and it will be one of the highest nominees. And it's like I think it's getting editing now. I think it's going to be nominated for editing. I think it's going to be nominated for score. I think it's going to be nominated for supporting actress. Like. It is getting so many nominations. It could even make so, director. It could. I, I think it could as well. Uh, you mentioned score there. You said above, uh, you don't know what else the Fablemans could win. Obviously, I haven't heard the whole score for Fablemans, but I saw the trailer again today, and that theme music that plays in the trailer is so good. Probably the whole it's, rest of the score isn't that good. That's not that good? John Williams. Oh, it's not? All right, then never mind. <laughs> and that's the thing with the whole take, movie. Take away any, my claim. Take away my claim. Anytime there's a song that I'm like, oh my God, that song's beautiful, later I learned it wasn't John Williams. Then why would you use that when it doesn't matter? The, the score in the trailer is really good, even if it's not John Williams. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Yeah, no, the, like I, I think I've said before, I still think that the score is going to be disqualified for the Fablemans because the most pivotal moment of the film um, there's, I'm not going to spoil it for you, but there's a moment where uh, Michelle Williams is playing a sad song on the piano as the the literal most pivotal moment of the entire film happens, which, like, Sammy Fableman is watching a reel of film, and we hear Michelle Williams playing the piano. And that song is what stuck with me after the film. It's not John Williams. It's a classical piece of music that I didn't recognize at the time and then stumbled upon later and was like, oh my God, this song is pre-existing and it's the most memorable song in the entire movie. Great, great. Good to know. Good to know. I look forward to whenever I see that movie, be like, that's not John Williams. It's not John Williams. Uh, but yeah. Um, anyways, yes. So thank you so much, everyone, for tuning in to this episode of Fantasy Film Ball. We are going to have a very packed week next week. Um, and the week after. So next week, we are going to be covering All Quiet on the Western Front. We're going to be covering Wendell and Wilde, and we're going to be covering... What's the last one that we're covering? Triangle of Sadness. Triangle of Sadness. Triangle of Sadness. And the week after that, we're going to be covering the entire Virginia Film Festival. Women Talking. She Said. Devotion. Maybe. Many other maybe. films. <laughs> EO. Hopefully. Hopefully um, EO. That's, that's the most important one. As well as Banshees. Maybe decision to leave. So many things to talk about. But until then, my name is Matt. And my name is Dill. And this is Fancy Film Ball. ka -chow. And thank you for tuning into this episode of Fancy Film Ball with Matt and Dill. Keep up to date with us on Twitter at FFilmBall. Subscribe to us on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you prefer to listen to podcasts. We even upload a video format of the podcast to YouTube if you want to see our faces. Thank you for listening to this episode of the show, and come back next week.